that's what we're going to talk about today. And a lot of people wonder, who is Jesus? He's got to be the most fascinating person in history, because for 2,000 years, everybody's been talking about that. Historians nowadays, you may have heard some of their theories. Um, Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. He was a charismatic healer, perhaps, or a holy man. He might have been a they consider a cynic philosopher who wanted radical change in society. Or he was the Jewish Messiah, which is about where we are, I think. Um, he might have been a prophet of social change. He was a rabbi. He was a wise teacher. And we hear that a lot in modern days. I, uh, a lot of people will say, I don't think Jesus is God. I think he was merely a wise teacher. Well, he might have been all of that and maybe more. And we're going to talk about that today from the Gospel of John. We've been um, going through that. This is our fourth week in the Gospel of John, and we have not yet finished chapter one. And that's because the Gospel is really quite deep. Um, but what's interesting is that it's often the first book that's recommended to non-Christians or to new believers to read in the Bible, because that's the question that it answers. It answers, who is Jesus? So... I personally love how John makes me think and dig in and meditate because I always get so much from all the work I put into it. This week we'll be reading about Jesus' first several disciples and how they all met each other and were called by Jesus. It can seem like a straightforward story, but there are so many wonderful layers and details that create other levels of meaning. I'm going to backtrack a bit to the part of this chapter about John the Baptist that Wayne preached on last week. You may remember that some Pharisees asked John the Baptist who he was, who John was. And John said he was the one promised in the Old Testament who would prepare the way for the Messiah. And he followed up by saying, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. So, as I said, Jesus, the John's Gospel is all about Jesus' identity, and especially this first chapter. And if you're wondering who is this guy anyway, here we are. Right away in this Gospel, John the Gospel writer, not John the Baptist, tells us that he wants us to know that Jesus is God's Word. And now John the Baptist says that Jesus is God's Messiah, God's chosen one. We know that the Jews of that day were expecting a Messiah, but this Jesus was clearly more than that. If John is, in a sense, John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet, Jesus is something much, much more than an Old Testament king, which is what the Messiah would be. I mean, how great would you have to be in order to be able to baptize with the Holy Spirit? Nobody could do that except for God. I think we've become a little too used to reading these passages um, and forget how incredible that must have sounded. Who before now gave the Holy Spirit? Well, it was only God. On the other hand, when we hear God's chosen one, we may think in this day and age that that sounds incredibly special. But really, all it does mean is anointed, and every king was anointed. So yes, of course, it's special, but it's not necessarily unique. Israel had had dozens of kings, and they'd all been anointed, but it's not necessarily I'm sorry, but uh, they hadn't had a king for um, hundreds of years. They desperately wanted a king, their Messiah. That's what they were looking for, their anointed one. But what does it mean to be a king that would be able to baptize with the Holy Spirit? Well, it says to me that this king would be one of a kind. He would be unique. He, his kingdom would be a spiritual kingdom. This little nugget of information is kind of tucked into John's testimony, and because we know the end of the story, it doesn't hit us like it must have hit John and John's followers. And John's followers come up next. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. 
When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So John the Baptist now calls Jesus the Lamb of God. That's another name, another title. And this phrase is only used here, believe it or not, only in John's Gospel and by John the Baptist. No one else ever refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God in the rest of the New Testament until Revelation, and then the Lamb is mentioned. Very likely, John was referring to the lamb offered at Passover. Jesus would be the atoning sacrifice for the people. At the cross, Jesus would indeed take away the sins of the whole world. John's disciples are so intrigued by this title, Lamb of God, that they leave John and follow Jesus. John's job, as he had said, was to point the way to Jesus, and there it happened. When Jesus saw them, he said, what do you want? And there could be a whole sermon on that. Um, and several times in the, this gospel, Jesus asks either this exact question or what are you seeking? This is always a great question. And how these men answer, to me, implies that these new followers want to know as much, um, much, much more about Jesus. They ask, where are you staying? And that suggests that they want to stay there too. And Jesus answers, come and you will see. And they spent the day with him. And what joy that must have been. And we know that because what happens next is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said, Lamb of God, and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So, all these guys, Peter and Andrew and Philip and Nathaniel, they thought they were looking for the Messiah. But the Messiah was already looking for them. Come and see who Jesus is, and he will tell you who you are. He will tell you, perhaps, that you're an Israelite without guile. He will see you. He will even look intently at you and say what your new name is. He might see you under a fig tree before you ever come to him. Do you remember Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, Abraham's first but not chosen son? She called the Lord God back then, well, 1,500 years before this, she had called him, the Lord God, the God who sees me. And Jesus is that same God. Come and see. I think of that as a gracious invitation. There's no pressure. There's no anxiety. You are welcome. See what you see. Draw your conclusions. Nathaniel saw Jesus, and his conclusion was that Jesus was the Son of God, the King of Israel. That's a pretty bold statement for a first meeting. But Jesus' response is even bolder. He says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I don't know if you noticed this, but in these two sections, 
Jesus is called Son of God, and then Jesus calls himself Son of Man. You may have heard people say that Jesus never did call himself the Son of God in the Gospels. He only does call himself the Son of Man, but that isn't really true, precisely. He does at least acknowledge that when people call him the Son of God, that it is true. And he calls himself other things as well. What's more, as Inigo Montoya might have said, I do not think that means what you think it means. So when Nathaniel said Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel, he's saying that he believes that Jesus is God's anointed Messiah, literally the King of Israel, not a divine person, not God himself. For example, in Psalm 2, written way before Jesus, um, God calls the king of Israel his son. He says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And today was the day that the king had been anointed and enthroned. That king, probably David or Solomon, that king was not divine. He was adopted by God. Now, interestingly, Roman Caesars often adopted their successors. So this isn't a weird concept to the Jews or to the Romans. In fact, the psalm was written, as I said, long before Rome conquered Israel. What's more, Roman Caesars also might take the title Son of God. In 42 BC, not that long before Jesus was born, Julius Caesar was formally deified as the divine Julius after his assassination. You remember the Ides of March, right? His adopted son, adopted son, Caesar Augustus, became known as son of the divine Julius, or simply son of the God. Later, Tiberius, who was emperor during Jesus' adulthood from 14 to 37 AD, he also was known as the son of the divine Augustus, another son of God. So the title son of God would not be a claim to divinity to the Jews or to anyone else at that time, but it would be dangerous. It was a dangerous claim because you're saying, I'm king and not Caesar. So that's not good. But Jesus, in this passage, doesn't say, you're right, Nathaniel, I'm the son of God. Instead, he says something far more meaningful. He says, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now, do you remember the time that Jacob had dreamed of a stairway to heaven. Now Jacob is the, the patriarch of the Jews whose his name was changed to Israel. So he's way back. He, Jacob, had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jesus is claiming to be the gate of heaven, where heaven and earth connect. He's saying, if you follow me, you'll be watching what it looks like when heaven and earth are open to each other. You might not necessarily see the angels themselves, but you'll see things happening that show their very presence. It's one of my favorite authors is N.T. Wright, and he says, I'm quoting here, when you're with Jesus, it's as though you're in the house of God, the temple itself, with God's angels coming and going, and God's own presence there beside you. But Jesus says something even more than that when he refers to himself as the Son of Man. He got this name from the book of Daniel. You may have learned about Daniel in Sunday school when you were a child, Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel's friends in the fiery furnace. Daniel was pretty awesome. He also had prophetic visions, and in Daniel 7, we read a piece of one vision. Oops, sorry. As I looked, thrones were set in place. Notice that it's thrones, not a throne. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 
10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So, in Daniel's vision, there are two thrones. One has the Ancient of Days sitting on it. We know that that's God, right? And the other one um, is for the Son of Man. A second figure, like a Son of Man, comes in on the clouds. He goes into the presence of the Ancient of Days, and the torch is passed to him. He was like a human, but he was also like God. And that's Jesus. That's who Jesus is claiming to be. In fact, Jesus is human and is God. There are two persons of the Trinity being described here in this ancient Old Testament book. The Ancient of Days is attended by tens of thousands, and the Son of Man is worshipped by all nations and people in one place and time, sitting on two thrones. It's pretty stunning, and every Jewish scholar, at least, maybe every Jew, would know what Jesus was claiming when he called himself the Son of Man. So, oddly, when Nathaniel calls Jesus the Son of God, he isn't saying Jesus is divine, at least not yet. And when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he actually is claiming to be divine. We've heard John describe Jesus throughout this chapter, starting at the very beginning. He, was, he is the Word. He is the true light. He is God's chosen one, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the one Moses wrote about, Rabbi, King of Israel, Son of God, and Son of Man. That's a lot. And we may feel, generally speaking, that we know who Jesus is, after all. Many of us, most of us in this room, I'm sure, are Christian believers. We've been going to church for years, perhaps, and maybe sometimes there's, I don't know, some insight from a sermon that makes you think when you come to church. Maybe you're touched by a song lyric during the service, but Jesus, Jesus invites us to come and see who he truly is for real. Let's do that. Let's see for ourselves this week who Jesus is. We may see angels climbing up and down a staircase to heaven. Come and see. Amen.